Cairo, Seattle. This is Your Last Meal. I'm your host, Rachel Bell, and every episode I interview a celebrity about what they would eat for their last meal. Then we explore the history of that food, the culture, and whatever else we can cram into 30 minutes. Today on the program, Dan Pashman, who is the host of one of my favorite podcasts, WNYC's The Sporkful. It's not for foodies, it's for eaters. Each week on our show, we obsess about food to learn more about people. And author of the book, Eat More Better, How to Make Every Bite More Delicious. We'll chat with Dan about the proper way to eat a burger and what it's like to be food obsessed, but have a spouse who isn't. She will eat cereal for dinner every night. Also, we're going to get a history lesson. We need to learn about the history of the tortilla. You probably have tortillas in your fridge right now. You might even have a tortilla in your belly. And we're going to chat with a Los Angeles chef who can turn anything into a burrito. We did that burgerito burrito, which is like a cheeseburger, everything on it with bacon and Thousand Island. But first... Dan Pashman. Dan is all about what the internet calls eating hacks. He has a theory that he calls the proximity effect that I've kind of adopted and I keep trying to teach people about the proximity effect. I'll teach you it right now. Uh, Dan describes the proximity effect in this little clip from his cooking channel web series, You're Eating It Wrong. I have this concept I call the proximity effect. It says that whenever you take any bite, Whatever part of the bite is in closest proximity to your tongue, that flavor will be accentuated. So, for example, if you're eating a burger, Dan thinks you should put the cheese under the patty, right on top of the bottom bun. First thing about cheese on the bottom is that it protects the bottom bun from getting too soggy. It seals in the juice. Cheese on the bottom means more cheesy goodness. And in his pizza episode, he visits a classic New York pizzeria to share his tips for getting the best bite of pizza. Have you ever considered eating your pizza, folding it inside out? Here, here's, where, here's where I'm going with this. Yes. You fold it inside out, the cheese, the sauce, the toppings, they go directly onto your tongue. Oh, oh man. And it kind of, it gives you a crust chaser. It's a, it, it inverts the entire experience so that the cheese and the sauce are facing out and then they go directly onto your tongue. Try it right now. Do it. Sound. Oh, yeah. I gotta tell my mom about this. This is incredible. It's good. Oh, yeah, this is actually, <laughs> it's actually good, eh? It tastes even better. Right there, it touches your taste buds quicker. So good. Who thought of this? Wow. Me? Wow. Wow. <laughs> You're a genius. I might not have been the first, actually, but thank you. So just like me, Dan worked in news radio for a long time. The only difference is I still do, and Dan does not any longer. But <laughs> obsessing over culinary concepts has always been his true passion. So making the sporkful his job is truly a dream come true. Is there anything that you had been ranting about? I mean, literally since you were a child, something that bugged you that you just are getting off your chest now? I mean, the, the whole cheese on the bottom or cheese close to your tongue thing is something I have. That's one of my earliest real food breakthroughs. Um, I, you know, I, I don't know exactly how old I was when I first started thinking about that, but I think it was at a very young age. Like My parents would have friends over, and there would often be cheese and crackers, and I can remember putting the cheese on top of the cracker and eating it and thinking, hmm, I mostly taste cracker. I wonder how I could taste more cheese. Obviously, I could just eat plain cheese, but I kind of like the crunch of the cracker. And I thought, well, you taste with your tongue, right? So why don't I just put it in my mouth with the cheese right straight on my tongue? And I tasted a lot more cheese, and I became an evangelist for, for the technique. So somebody who is so obsessed with food and thinks about it all the time and eats all the time, I'm extra curious to know what your last meal would be. Well, you know, I thought about this a bit, and I knew we were going to be talking. I can say this with total certainty. My last meal would be wrapped inside a flour tortilla. Since I was a child, I have loved all foods wrapped in any type of incarnation of a flour tortilla. My, my aunt moved to Houston in the 80s. I grew up in New Jersey, and it was the first time that we New Jerseyans experienced fajitas. I mean, real fajitas. Like, and you, they, have a, well, they have a person there in the fajita place making the flour tortillas by hand, to order. And then I got into mushu pork, which of course is different from a flour tortilla, but similar in many ways. I got into Peking duck. I love burritos. I love nizami rolls. Every culture has some version of deliciousness wrapped inside a flour tortilla. And I think my last meal would sort of be like a flour tortilla 
and then whatever else happened to be around. Maybe there'd be one spicy Indian dish inside a flour tortilla, one Peking duck inside a flour tortilla, and one carnitas in, uh, with some, some probably some cheese and some beans inside a flour tortilla. I think that that trio, I would want a flour tortilla flight. <laughs> that would be my last meal. So is it actually the taste and the texture of the tortilla that you're using to wrap, or is it the mobility that you create by putting things inside of it? What is it about this vessel that you like so much? I think it's mostly taste and texture. I, I love the chewiness of it. I love the way that the foods inside sort of adhere to the inside of it in a way that that comes together so beautifully, especially when you have melted cheese or foods like beans or avocado and just the right level of chewiness. And if you if they, they if they you know put the flour tortilla on a griddle a little bit and crisp it a little bit on the outside, like in San Francisco, they'll roll a burrito and then they'll fry it in oil. And when you can get it just a little bit crispy on the outside and then chewy on the inside, and then you get this cavalcade of flavors pouring out from inside, that bite, I mean, oh, God, that's all I need right there. So do you have a particular brand that you like? Because I struggle with this. I think a lot of the grocery store tortillas are not that great, uh, but you can't always, you know, get to a taqueria and get homemade ones and making your own takes time. What do you do? What is your standard? I happen to like Trader Joe's handmade flour tortillas. Yeah. They have a couple versions. Get the ones that are, say handmade. They have a blue label. I, I like that they are different shapes, which suggests some amount of <laughs> either they've trained a machine to replicate human error or they actually have human error. But I like that. I like that, that they're not all the exact same cookie cutter shape. Um, but also a good general tip. That, that actually Weird Al told me about when I had him on the Sporkful. If you have a flour tortilla that's been in the fridge and it's not so great, heat up a nonstick pan, take the flour tortilla and run it under hot water on each side, just very quickly, quick splash, just to get a thin coating of water on each side, and then throw that into the nonstick pan and you know, until, it's, until it gets nice and hot on each side. And that will really rejuvenate a flour tortilla. My hack, and this only works if you have a gas stove, and I've been doing this forever, is I just turn on the gas stove and then I run the tortilla over it on both sides and it gets mm. so chewy and blistery. And my kind of I'm alone secret late night snack is to do that and just take a stick of butter and hold it in my fist and just rub it all over it uh, <laughs> <laughs> until it's glistening. And then like whatever I have, I actually like to put like truffle salt on it, which is sounds kind of weird. Or I put tapatio or I just smear it in sour cream. Oh my God, but like, that sounds fantastic. It's so good. What is the strangest thing that you have wrapped inside of a tortilla? Oh, that's a good question. The strangest thing that I've wrapped. I mean, I, I, I keep flour tortillas in my house pretty much all the time. I will wrap almost any random, le like if I have like a random leftover in the fridge and I'm like kind of like, eh, yeah, I don't want it to go to waste, but I'm not all that excited about it. I'll wrap it in a flour tortilla. I've taken just like plain leftover beets and I'll take a flour tortilla, I'll sprinkle some cheese in the tortilla, microwave it, and I'll throw the beets in. And I will eat that, and it's fantastic. I'll take seitan and avocado, fry up the seitan so it gets nice and crispy, add the avocado, and then my mom made some gribbonus, which is like a traditional Jewish uh, food that's sort of like little bits of fried chicken fat. It's almost like... Um, Bacon bits, but but fried chicken fat um, with onion, and they're like just little crispy bits of salty fat. And I sprinkle that over the seitan and the avocado. I put that inside a flour tortilla. Fantastic. Look, sensory scientists who have researched texture will tell you that the type of bite that most humans enjoy best is one that has what they call dynamic contrast. We don't always love monotextural bites. I mean, unless, like, if it's something like a Dorito that has just the right crunch, that's an exception. But when you can have a bite that's a little bit crispy or crunchy and a little bit chewy and a little bit gooey and soft and get all of those together in one bite, you're really going to be on cloud nine, you know? Yes. And when you, when you start with a flour tortilla, it's very easy to achieve dynamic contrast. We're going to take a quick break, but when we come back... The Farito. The Farito, it is a portmanteau made up of pho and a burrito. And we're going to talk about the inventor of the Farito, chef owner of the Los Angeles restaurant, Komodo. 
meal, Sporkful host Dan Pashman wants anything that he can wrap inside of a tortilla. And when he told me this, I immediately thought of Komodo, a Los Angeles restaurant that I've read about in magazines, seen online, uh, a restaurant that occasionally goes viral because of their magical tortilla wrap creations. At Komodo, they do a loco moco burrito. If you know what a loco moco is, it's a classic Hawaiian breakfast uh, with hamburger patty and rice and sunny side up eggs. And he smushes this all up in a tortilla. They do a banh mi burrito, but they are most famous for their farito, Vietnamese noodle soup in burrito form. Here is Komodo chef owner Erwin Chayati. Growing up in uh, San Gabriel Valley, where a majority of Asians, um, I'm so lucky to live around that neighborhood because like we, we could have like you know Vietnamese food, Thai food, Cambodian food everywhere. It's just like it's like within reach, you know, um, less than two miles away from my house, and and just eating eating pho, you know, with my my dad every morning when it's like winter. Um, it really inspired me. It's like you know, what, how can I make this and uh, roll it into a burrito where people could eat it, it, could eat it while walking and and taking it to go without having like the broth all over or sitting down, you know. All right. So the burrito started off as a fun, whimsical special on the menu, but when people started lining up around the block for two weeks straight to get one, uh, Chef Irwin decided that he had something special here. But he only serves it seasonally in the winter because pho is a soup. So therefore, the farito is a winter item. Can I ask you a question? Yes, producer Aaron Mason. Does your pho consumption change with the seasons? Uh, Yeah, I eat more pho in the winter for sure. I have more of a ritual that I like to eat pho when I come back from a trip. Ooh, That is my food that I eat when I get back into town. It's your home base. It's my home base It's how you find your center. It is. I will not eat pho in the summer. It's too hot. Well, in Vietnam and in tropical places, they eat soup in the hot weather anyway because they think it brings the body temperature down. You sweat it out. Mm. Yeah. What is inside of the farito? So inside the farito, first of all, we have the tortillas as, as the base for the wrap. And then we use um, thinly sliced beef ribeye. We um, slightly poach it for about a minute or two minutes with, uh, with a, a farito broth, which consists of charred cinnamon stick, charred onion, star anise, clove, garlic coriander, and I just add a little bit of, of my flavor with a bay leaf. We add our vermicelli noodle, and then we add fresh bean sprouts, t- fresh Thai basil, and saute onion and jalapenos. And then we just drizzle it with a little bit of a hoisin sauce and sriracha, and we wrap them all together. But the farito was not invented overnight. Chef Irwin said it took quite a bit of time to perfectly engineer the farito to make sure that it was super juicy, like soup, without actually drenching it in the pho broth. So at first, I like this idea, they experimented with serving broth on the side. So you would dip the burrito in the broth like a French dip. But as you can expect, all the burrito stuff fell into the broth and it was all just kind of a big mess. But eventually he perfected it. I can't wait to try it on my next trip to L.A. Uh, And they came up with a new item that is now the top seller. It's the Bulgogi Rito inspired by his Korean business partners. They really inspire me. They always take me out to go Korean barbecue and eat different places like K-Town in Los Angeles. And what's inside is um, pork belly. Um, We just marinated in a kochijang sauce, which is like a red pepper paste um, with a little bit of soy sauce. We marinated overnight. What's inside is pretty much a a, a char seared uh, pork belly meat. And we t- top it off with sriracha aioli, which is, consists of sriracha, um, homemade aioli, and roasted garlic. And we just blend them together. A um, little bit of sesame, um, roasted sesame seed. And we use um, pickled red cabbage for the for the color. So when we wrap them all together, you get that nice um, orange for the sauce. You get that redness from the meat. And then you get the purple with a little bit of sesame seed and green onion for the green color. Just like Dan, Irwin tends to think that anything can be wrapped in a tortilla. But he has had some fails making like a pizza burrito we did that one time it kind of failed it's too much cheese too much meat it's just like a mess can you talk about what went into the pizza burrito i'm assuming you didn't do a crust inside of the tortilla did you no we didn't um, we actually use um um we we cut up like um, a baguette bread kind of like cube so you get that kind of like that texture of bread and we just throw like um a saute sausage and we got pepperoni in there we got um, jalapenos, green bell pepper, and then we just saute them together and we just top it out with cheese, um, tomato sauce, and then we just bake it in the oven and we just pour it in the burrito and wrap it. Kind of like fail because it's just too too much sauce and too much, it's so gooey. I'm feeling inspired. Yeah. I feel like a spaghetti and meatballs burrito would be really good. Yeah, that, that, that'd be really good too, yeah. <laughs> 
I don't think Erwin likes my idea. I know fake laughter when I hear it. And just like Dan, Erwin has been wrapping things in tortillas long before he opened his restaurant. What inspired me to make a, a lot of this food and, and Komodo is, um, is because I, I, as a cook, it's always like you're always under the pressure. You always have a lot of um, preparation to do for service. So when it comes to, comes to eat, it's like you just pretty much grab everything that you can you know, leftover food from like the day before or whatever, whatever meat that we have that we could eat as a family meal. Uh, you know, I just want to have something quick. So I just pretty much wrap everything in a burrito. You know, sometimes they don't have rice. We don't have time to get grab a plate. It's something quick, something, something better. And you, you could have everything in one wrap, you know, and you just bite it and like it takes five minutes to eat and like you just continue working. Tortillas. You probably have a bag of them in your fridge right now. Did you know that Americans buy more tortillas than they do hamburger or hot dog buns? We will dig into the history of the tortilla when we come back. Salsa outsells ketchup in the United States. Americans buy more tortilla chips than potato chips, and tortillas have outsold hamburger and hot dog buns. At this point in America, we kind of consider Mexican food to be our own. We don't consider it a foreign food. We have officially claimed nachos and tacos as our own. But of course, tortillas are from Mexico. And unlike all of the flour tortillas you see on our store shelves, they were solely made from corn. Jeffrey Pilcher wrote the book Planet Taco, A Global History of Mexican Food. He's also a professor of history at the University of Toronto, if you hear a little bit of that Canadian accent. So a tortilla is, uh, you know, kind of a flatbread made out of a particular kind of corn that has been processed through what the Mexicans call nixtamal, uh, which is basically in hominy in the United States. Uh, it's, it's cooked with uh, a mineral lime, alkali processing. Uh, and it, it, there's a lot of important reasons why the, the, that happens for nutritional reasons, among others. Um, but it also actually... Uh, has a lot of taste and it really does add a lot of kind of umami flavors to the corn and so it's 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 a very distinctive taste the nixtamal uh it, there's his archaeological evidence of that going back to the ancient maya 2500 years ago um the tortilla itself probably was um a much later invention that the original um nixtamal was used for things like tamales which are cakes made out of the same dough and the uh, tortilla is one that's cooked on this uh, distinctive griddle earthenware griddle called a comal and the archaeological record of that kind of provides a, at least a base for when the, the the tortilla would have been invented and and it, it it seems to come not from so much from the maya lands of of the uh, the yucatan south uh, eastern mexico but rather from the central valley uh, and so we can imagine the the first tortillas being made 2000 years ago at um, uh, teotihuacan for example i mean they're, they're, these are all kind of archaeological speculations we don't have the origins of them but that's uh, roughly where they would have uh, have come from okay so i lived in japan for a year about 6 years ago and i craved flour tortillas when I was living there. So I finally decided to just go online, get a recipe and make them myself. I mixed flour and water and oil together to make a dough. And then I rolled them out using a tall can of Asahi, which I think many Mexican abuelos were rolling over in their graves. And then I rolled them out on a cutting board that was balanced over my sink because my Japanese kitchen was approximately the size of an edamame pod. Then I cooked them in a nonstick pan. And they turned out okay, especially compared to not eating tortillas. But Jeffrey tells us how a real handmade corn tortilla is supposed to be made. You take the corn, you t- remove it from the husk, uh, you simmer it in um, this mineral lime, take esquite as they call it in indigenous languages, Nahua. Then you kind of soak off the husks. So all you've got is just that kind of starch in the center. Um, and then you grind it 
And, you know, traditionally this was done by hand on these uh, basalt grinding stones and these images of women with, you know, big muscular uh, triceps grinding, you know, kneeling over the the, the, the metate stone grinding the, the tortilla. And that's, I mean, that was some serious work. I mean, we're talking about hours of work every day. And it's really only in the 20th century uh, mechanical mills have mechanized that process of making the nixtamal. And then uh, once you've got that dough, and it's it's ground wet, right? So it's not a dry corn powder, but it's a it's this sort of wet dough. Uh, you take a little ball about the size of a golf ball, and you put it in between your hands, and you pat it out, uh, just kind of patting it back and forth 33 times. Uh, and you can only do this, by the way, if you've like spent your entire life doing it. I, I've tried, and, and believe me, it's not something you learn late in life. So anyway, so you've got this little round of corn dough, and what you do is you slide it across the comal, being very careful that no air bubbles get trapped underneath it. And the comal is like really, really hot griddle, which is to say, you know, if you drop a, a little drop of water on it, it will just completely steam. And uh, you cook it for about eh, 30 seconds or so. Uh, kind of peel it up a little bit with your fingers. By the way, people who cook tortillas have like, you know, asbestos for fingers because, you know, they're, they're basically using their hands on top of this like really hot comal. So anyway, you kind of peel it up and then you eventually, when it's got in that kind of nice firm setting on the bottom, you turn it over and you cook it on the other side. Turn it a third time and if it's everything comes out right, it will actually puff up like a little balloon, puff up very nicely. And, and, and that's, you know, you've got a perfect uh, tortilla. So that's how it's done by hand, and they've got you know fancy machines now that do it, and all kinds of other stuff. But that would, if 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 somebody wants to have you know last meal kind of tortillas, that's what they want. They they don't want this stuff coming off of the uh, the factory line. So I feel like in our country, in the United States, most people prefer flour tortillas. The problem with corn is that. It really has to be fresh. I mean, it's like eating a donut that's been sitting around on the on the you know in in, in the, ref, uh, the the refrigerator or on the uh, you know in the grocery store shelf for a couple of weeks. I mean, you know, <laughs> it doesn't taste very good. Uh, a tortilla, you know, that's fresh off the comal is a, you know a completely different thing. You know, if you don't know a Mexican, you know, uh, abuela, you know, a grandmother to to ha to make them for you, you're not gonna gonna find good ones. And so, you know, it's not surprising that the the wheat flour tortilla, which is is not quite as apparent. Ooh, that reminds me, Chef Irwin from Komodo has a very special way that he heats up his tortillas that I think would really please Dan Pashman. I like to warm it up kind of crispy on one side and then you have that crispiness on the inside where you roll the, the burrito so you get that nice texture so soft on the outside and then kind of crispy on the inside oh that's cool i've never heard of that before and then i imagine that the liquid doesn't kind of absorb as much there's kind of like a shield between the inside exactly. of the burrito yeah so when you bite it it's like oh it's like crispiness like where you get that crispiness like nice and toasty you know on the inside and then but outside it's kind of like just really kind of like flexible and and warm Let's go back to Dan, who doesn't always just eat things wrapped in tortillas. Is there a food that you eat when you are not around your kids and spouse because they don't like it? And so you can't really serve it at dinner because no one will eat it. You just wait till like you're on a business trip or everyone's out of town and you're like, yes, I can have my thing. Uh, yeah, well, the, uh, yes, absolutely. My wife doesn't care about food. You know, like what? she when I go out, when I travel for business and I'm not home to like fix a nice dinner, and she's a good cook, but she just sort of like isn't motivated to do it. She just doesn't care. She will eat cereal for dinner every night. You know, if the two of us go out for dinner and it costs $50 total, she'll be like, ah, oh, $50. You know, we could have gone to Panera. It would have cost <laughs> eight. You know, like that's her, <laughs> that's her attitude. Yeah. Um, but it, what, what's funny about your question, Rachel, is that things are changing because my older daughter, who's now six and a half, she... She is a very promising young eater and she's becoming like my eating buddy because she loves to try new foods and she's, she loves to eat as like I do and gets a lot of joy from eating the way that I do. And so um, she and I, I'm starting to inculcate her and we have had a lot of fun exploring. You know, I've got her into eating pupusas and chicharrones uh, when we go to the uh, uh, Latin American places near us. Uh, I've gotten her into some Indian food. She's still a little tentative on the spice, but she's getting there. So I'm going to start spending my money taking her out because she will appreciate it. <laughs> All the big holidays. You're like, sorry, honey, I know it's our anniversary, but I'm going to take our daughter out because she'll appreciate right. it. <laughs> uh, and you know, my wife will be like, 
fine, good, you know. <laughs> is there any like food invention that you have poking around in your brain that hasn't been invented yet that you're just dying to get on the market, something that you think people could really use or benefit from? <sighs> well, if I did, I don't know that I would tell you now, Rachel. Ooh, yeah, you don't want anyone to, to steal honest, your idea. I, mean, I asked you this because it made me remember an idea I had a long time ago that everybody hated, and I don't know why, which was little smoky buns. Like, I thought it'd be so cute to, that a little smoky could sit in its own tiny bun, and you could just have like small hot dogs that would be fit for a hamster. <laughs> <laughs> that is an interesting concept. It's funny. This is another difference between my family and my wife's family. You know, their family's Jewish, pretty observant. She grew up Friday night was Shabbat dinner, and they do the blessings and the challah and family meal and all that. In my house, I mean, I grew up Jewish too, but less observant. In my house, Friday night was called cocktail party. <laughs> and, and my mom would make a, a whole bag of, of Hebrew national mini hot dogs, essentially little Smokies, and put them out in the living room with ketchup and mustard. And my parents would have cocktails, and my brother and I would have Shirley Temples, and we would hang out in the living room eating mini hot dogs for dinner. That is so fun. And that was Dan Pashman's last meal. Not the hot dog part, the tortilla part. You know, like most of the episode. Dan Pashman is the host of one of my favorite podcasts, The Sporkful. He's author of the book, Eat More Better, How to Make Every Bite More Delicious. And he hosts the cooking channel web series, You're Eating It Wrong which is addictive, and you will not be able to stop watching. And he has a new animated show called The Snackdown. Big thanks to Erwin Chayati, chef owner of Komodo in Los Angeles, and Jeffrey Pilcher, author of the book Planet Taco, A Global History of Mexican Food. This episode was produced by Aaron Mason and myself, music by Prom Queen. And if you like the theme music, wait till you hear her other songs. She is dreamy. Google Prom Queen music. And if you like this podcast, please give us a rating if your device allows you to do that. It helps other people to find the podcast, which means we can make more episodes, which means we won't go out of podcast business. I'm Rachel Bell, and until next time, this is your last meal. 